Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends. I'm here with my friend Philip Thomas, and we are continuing. In fact, we're almost done with our Bible study in the book of 1 Timothy. One of the last letters that Paul wrote to his protege and friend, Timothy, as a new pastor of a big church in Ephesus. And we've been watching through this, and we are coming to a very interesting, and for me, a very challenging section of Scripture today. You know, in this day and age on YouTube, we see the side hustle. I don't know if you've heard that term or not, Philip, but yes. uh, I, I see it all the time over, over YouTube, the side hustle, where you're doing a job and you're nine to five, and then on the side, you have a hustle for making more money. Yeah. And you hear all over the YouTube, you'll hear, and the internet for that matter, you'll hear stories about guys who went from unemployed to making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And they're sitting out front of their videos with their mansion and sitting on their, their Ferrari or everything. It seems like in this culture, the side hustle or the pursuit of wealth is a cultural phenomenon. And Today, we're going to talk about Paul addressing that very thing in the culture of Ephesus of the day. And we're going to be talking about the side hustle and the pursuit of getting rich. We'll do that right after we come back. Hi, and welcome back to Bible Study with Friends. Today, we've got a very interesting scripture to look at. We Last week, we ended with verse 8. And verse 8 does finish a section, but it also transitions into this next section that Paul is going to address as a segment of the, of the church in Ephesus that Timothy, Pastor Timothy, is going to have to pay attention to on that very subject. So as we go along here, let's let's look. We see verse 9 starting right back up with verse 7 and 8 talks about, let's look at 7 and 8 just real quick. We have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. We talked about being content last week. In fact, the title last week was contentment, and dangerous desires. And this week, he's going to go, he's going to transition by being content. If we've got the basics taken care of, we should be content. Now, that doesn't mean lazy. It doesn't mean uh, a do-nothing. But it does mean being content with what God has provided for us. And then verse 9 starts out with an interesting word. What's the word? But but now if we look at what the word but means if you're going back to your your english days ninth grade english <laughs> what does but mean uh i mean it's just a like there's an alternative well i was gonna say there's an alternative coming but you're you're on the right track alternative that means but is a contrast word okay so it's something but something else. And the, the something else is in contrast to what just went before. So he's talking about being content in verse 8. And then he says, but. So we're, got, we're about to read a contrasting statement. And he says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Now, that's a quite a verse for us to think about. One of the determining words in there is those who want to get rich. It's a dominant thing in my thought process is I want to be rich. I remember a guy saying that to me. He says, all I know is I want to get rich. <laughs> And that's what he's talking about here. And there were those in Ephesus. Remember, Ephesus is a business city. Yeah. It's a commerce city. And the church has got Christians who are rich and poor, slaves, 
prostitutes, Gentiles, Jews. It's a mix in all these little home churches under the banner of the church in Ephesus and under the leadership of Timothy. So he's saying now, I'm going to give you some teaching about those who want to get rich. Now he's talking specifically about those in the church that want to get rich, but this applies to the entire community. It's just the spiritual application of this is just for believers. Okay. Now he says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation. Now, temptation is the opposite of contentment. Because if I'm content with what I have, I'm not being tempted to get this new thing or earn this amount of money so that I can achieve this or get this or buy that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So the temptation to acquire is the opposite of contentment. And that's this word, but. It's a contrast between contentment and a striving after the hustle. Now, I've noticed lately that there have been a number of YouTube videos on kind of against the hustle culture that are saying the hustle culture doesn't give you peace. It doesn't bring you contentment. It's, it's every moment of every day when I'm done with work, I come home and I strive in my side hustle to get rich. And I, I ignore things like my family and my friends and my relationship with God even. So we see this being content with our, with our life and our relationship. Now, this doesn't mean God can't provide for you. It doesn't mean that you can't get rich. Mm -hmm. In fact, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, one of my favorite uh, chapters in Deuteronomy, it talks about God is giving you the power to make wealth, but you're doing it under the relationship with God and not as a something to strive after. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Because people that are striving to get rich, I just can't wait to get rich. I got to work to get rich. They fall into all kinds of temptations. And what it says right here, harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Now, ruin is... Uh, interesting word. I've got a cross reference there. T flip over to James chapter one, verse 15, Philip. Okay. This desire can, can move us into ruin. All right. It says, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has accomplished, it brings forth death. Okay. Now that, that word lust is a craving after, and that's what this guy, what, what Paul's talking about, about this guy. I, I want to be rich. I crave to be rich. And the pursuit of riches brings about all kinds of other temptations. It may bring about a temptation to cheat, mm. a temptation to do whatever it takes at work to achieve the next level. Lie, cheat, and steal. Take advantage of other people. Take credit where the credit needs to be somebody else. This is the opposite of the Christian philosophy of serve other people and consider other people as more important than yourselves. And you can set that aside if you have this desire, this craving, this lust after getting rich. And that's what Paul says. It moves you into ruin. Your life can become a disaster. Now, that back in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, flip over just to just those three. It's talking about Leaders in the church should be very careful about this desire to get rich. Look over First Timothy chapter three, verse three. It says, "Not addicted to wine or pugnacious, pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free, free from the love of money. Free from the love of money. And that love is not agape. It's it's this love of uh, I I, I want to have a relationship with money." Now that's for the that's for the elder, that's for the pastor and the staff, the elder. Now look at what it says about the deacon. Uh, look at verse eight. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain. Okay, sordid gain is gain that I get no matter what. 
right? Sorted gain is I get that gain with sorted methods. Wow. All right. So elders and deacons need to be free from this craving to get rich. And he's addressed that last week and he's addressing it more here. Now, verse 10 says, for, or, and that, I hate that word for, because it basically means because. They, they run into all these harmful desires which plunge men, plunge men into ruin and destruction because the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Now, there's some things that we take out of context and we misquote in this, in this verse right here. Number one, money is not the root of all kinds of evil. Right. What does it say? Uh, the love. The love, the craving for money is the root. What's the description of, of the, the root of all sorts of evil? It's not the. See it right here? Wonder? Oh, A? The. The love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. It is not the only root of evil. If You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's so if a guy says money is the root of all evil, it, it's just wrong. The love of money is a root. There are a lot of other roots of evil. That makes sense, yeah. There, there, there are all kinds of other things. Now, I love the word root there. Now, when you think of a plant, what do you think of when you think of the root? I mean, something, that, something that's not seen and goes pretty deep. Okay, it goes deep. And the function of the root is it is it collects stuff. And then out of that root grows the plant yeah right so when it talks about it's the root of all evil it's it's at the very core it's at the bottom of where evil comes from in your life you plant a little seed of i want more money and all of a sudden that seed takes root and you become obsessed with the hustle for i want to get rich and out of that root grows ruin and destruction out of that root grows a family that thinks you're a workaholic and you never pay attention to them as kids. And that, that moves into their adult lives because they've been ignored. But the parent would say, oh, yeah, but I'm trying to provide for them. Yeah. Well, the provision that they crave is the provision of time. Sure. So ask yourself the question. Am I taking the time to provide quality time for my, my family? Not a little shrug here and there is time, and I, the rest of my time is in this pursuit of evil. You follow what he's, what he's building here? I believe so, yeah. This picture he's painting? It's the root of all, all sorts of evils. And, and some, some people... By longing for it, what's the it? Money. Money. By longing for it, that's this lust, this craving. I want to get rich. I get up in the morning and how? What can I do today to get more money? You know? Yeah. I know people like that, and I I, I know you do because it they're out there in the culture. Sure. And, and it's something that they're always talking about, for sure. Yeah. And what they want to talk about with you is their latest thing to make some more money. That's It, it, it comp comprises their life. And they're not content. In fact, uh, Christians can look at God as just a way of making more money. Mm. I'm okay. going to pray a certain way. I'm going to do a certain thing. I'm going to, I'm going to go to... A worship service for the sake of God will bless me with more money. Wow. I'm even going to give because if I give X, he will give me Y. That's, that's the basis of the health and wealth heresy. And it, so it can, it can seep into our Christian experience. Now we're going along. And he says, many by longing for that money, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, look, this is not people that lose their salvation. We talked about this earlier in the book. 
in, in verse 19 about the shipwreck of faith, that the life can be a shipwreck. That's not losing your salvation. And so now instead of going to heaven, you're going to go to hell. That's, that is going to heaven still, but living a life that's a mess. It's a, it's a, a wreck up on the shore and it's, you got pieces spread all over the place. So it's not talking here about losing your salvation. It's talking about being saved, but walking away from the faith. Why would you walk away from the faith? Because you're walking away from the pursuit of a relationship with God and walking towards what? Getting rich, right? Money. Money. Now, you could be a Christian and get way off the track by pursuing money. And, and it leads to griefs. And I'll tell you what, I know some very, very, very rich people that their life is filled with grief. And they're not content. One, a guy asked, I think it was Rockefeller one time, he said, how much is enough? And he said, I don't know. Oh, wow. Rich people that are pursuing riches are not content people. There's never enough. And their life is really full of griefs because it can be uh, what, what's my next month's earnings going to be? Have I achieved the next stage? Oh, no, I didn't do that. Or, oh, no, that cost me money. Or, oh, no, that was a waste of money. Or, oh, no, YouTube has demonetized my channel. <laughs> right? Uh, we got to be careful as Christians. And, and Paul is going to tell us to be careful here in the next thing. And this, this is the, the verse, uh, these two verses, 11 and 12, challenged me early on in my, in my life. It, let me read them to you. I'll, I'll flow it through, and then we're going to come back and dissect them a little bit. It says, but there's a contrast again. Those who are longing after money walk away from the faith and are pierced by many griefs, right? Yeah, but now I'm going to give you contrast, but here's the command. And this is put in a command. Flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The, these are two powerful verses. Now, one of the things we notice, we're, we're going to dissect this down to ninth grade English again. In these two verses, there are four verbs, four things that we should be doing. And all of them are commands. These are not suggestions Paul gives as something to consider. These are commands Paul gives. He gives them to Timothy, and he gives them to the people in Timothy's church. He gives them to us as readers under the inspired word of God, right? So what's the first verb? Fight. Nope. Fight is that? Well, ver <laughs> verse 11. Oh, okay. Oh, verse 11. Flee. Flee. Yeah. Now, it says flee from what? These things. Now, in the context of this verse, it's talking about these things are the pursuit of money. Right. Right? That's the context. But in other places in the New Testament, we are told to flee from other things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're supposed to flee from adultery, and we're supposed to flee from idolatry but there are there are a number of things that we need to flee from in the context here and this verb this command is specifically to flee the craving for money so we can ask ourselves the question here's a command flee from the things of craving money how are you doing how am i doing with flee now what is the word flee mean to you uh, i think about running away like yeah the direction. yeah i mean i, I think of, of in in genesis where joseph is 
in in Potiphar's ho- home and his wa- and his Potiphar's wife is trying to seduce him. What yeah. does he do? He flees. He runs. Yeah. <laughs> he literally, and that's the word he uses, flees. Yeah. He runs as fast as he can. And it's this idea of flee is you run in the opposite direction, right? Yeah. Now that's key in a second. So we need to run from these desires to get rich. We need to make a living. Nothing wrong with wanting a raise, working hard for a raise. But we're talking about a voraciousness of a desire to make more and more and more money and a, a lust for money. And he says, first thing, flee from these things. He uses a very interesting term here, and this is a challenging term. Flee from these things, you man of God. I don't know about you, but it's been my desire as a, as a young Christian and for the last 50 years, I would really like to be a man of God. I'd like to be considered by the Lord as a man of God his man. I'd like to be considered by other people as a man of God. And it is one of the things that I want to have in my life and that I am working at. That's why in our Bible study, our goal is to show and grow a passion for studying God's word, because from God's word, from the sound doctrine of God's word, is where we are going to acquire the ability to become a man of God. That's a great term. And it's it's a thought process. Am I now a man of God? When Paul is talking, flee from these things, O man of God. Is he talking to me? Now, I did an interesting Bible study here, Philip. I went up and said, man of God, to us today, we, we hear the term man of God a lot. We do, yeah. But in the scripture... There were only six guys, six men, that that term was applied to. In Deuteronomy 33, 1, we see it applied to Moses. In, in 1 Samuel, we see it applied to Samuel. In 1 Kings 12, 22, we see it applied to Shemaiah. In 1 Kings 17, it's applied to Elijah. In, in 2 Kings 4, 7, it is applied to Elisha, Elijah's protege. In Jeremiah, it is applied to a guy named Igdalia. We don't know much about Igdalia, but it's an interesting verse. In Nehemiah, it's applied to David as a man of God. Now, I want you to flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17. Now, those, those six or seven guys, I guess it's seven guys, are called men of God. And they are the only ones in Scripture that have that title. Right? So you can say, wow, that's a pretty small club. It is. Moses and David and Samuel and Elijah and Elisha and uh, these other guys. <laughs> I can't even pronounce their name. But what we see Paul write in 2 Timothy, the next letter to Timothy, in chapter 3, verse 17. Read that. Uh, 17, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Okay. And it says, all verse 16 says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable that the man of God might be equipped. So this is all believers who are in the word of God are equipped to be a man of God. Wow. All of us. So you and me, Philip, we, we can attained by sticking with the scriptures, not by going outside the scriptures and going for a hustle, <laughs> but by sticking to the scriptures and our relationship with God, we can be men of God. That's good. Now, I want to go on with, with the rest of this very quickly. I want to look down here. So the first verb we get, the first command is run from this thing in your life that's this pursuit uh, of, of money because that's the root that's going to blossom into all kinds of, of evils and griefs in your life. So run from that. So if you find yourself thinking, boy, I could get rich doing that, or I could, you know, I could pursue some more money doing that. Run from that, from that greed, from that lust for money. 
Now the next verb is what? So we're we are in eleven, right? If we... Yeah. In, in, in verse in verse eleven, flee from these things, you man of God, and what? And pursue. Pursue. Now pursue is the opposite of flee, because if I flee, I'm going in that direction. If I pursue, I'm going in the direction of what I'm pursuing, right? Right. So where is the direction supposed to be in our lives? And let me quickly go through this. This is a challenging thing for us to think through and meditate on this week. Pursue righteousness in your life. So am I pursuing righteousness more than I'm pursuing money? Pursue godliness. Am I pursuing godliness? And I might do a Bible study on what's the difference between righteousness and godliness. Pursue faith. Faith towards God. Am I pursuing faith towards God, my relationship with God, and my trust in him as much as I'm pursuing wealth? Interesting question. Am I pursuing after faith? Do I wake up and say, how can I pursue, pursue a relationship in my faith, a building my faith today? How can I pursue trusting God today? Then it says, pursue love, pursue perseverance. Uh, this, is, this is love of others, love of God. This is not directed at me. This is pursuing something that's directed at others. Pursuing, how can I get up today and love Philip better? How can I love people in my church better? How can I love my pastor better today? That's something to pursue. Pretty challenging list, right? It is, yeah. Perseverance and gentleness. And there's some verses there, Galatians 5.22 and Ephesians 4, that talk about gentleness. And what I've noticed is a lot of people that are obsessed with the hustle aren't very gentle with the people around them. Why? Because they're... They're single-mindedly going after the hustle. Sure. Yeah. They're not very gentle. But we're told to pursue being gentle with people. Now, if I need to, if I need to be gentle with you, Philip, I need to do a couple of things. Number one is I have to know what would rub you the wrong way. I have to know you a little bit to know how to be gentle towards you. So there's a very interesting thing. If I'm going to pursue gentleness... I need to pursue a relationship with people and how to be gentle towards them, not argumentative. And this goes back to that list we had in not pugnacious, looking for a fight, but gentle. Now, the next verb, after we, we see what to run from in verse 11, and we see what to run to in verse 11. And it's quite a list. Run from this love of money this craving of money, and run towards righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. You write those things on a piece of paper, and you get up in the morning, and you look at that piece of paper, and you say, how can I pursue, how can I run after those things today? Mm. <clears throat> Challenge. It now, is. the next verse, that, ver that verb you like, is fight. And I, I did a little study on that. It, it's a verb that is from the Greek. It means an athletic struggle. It's not war. It, this first thing is struggle, compete. Okay. So we look back up here and it says, compete, struggle to do what? To fight the good fight. The good fight. Now, he uses the word fight again, but this is a different Greek word. That word fight, it means a military campaign. In other words, struggle, be, be uh, you know, practicing and struggling the way an athlete would to, to, to uh, compete well, right? To do what? The military campaign. This idea of a military campaign is not a single battle. Okay. But it's a campaign. So he's basically saying here in this third verse, in this third verb, fight, continually struggle with the military campaign of faith. The continual battles of faith. 
Faith is not something we achieve in our life with a single thing and it's over. We got it. It's an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing military campaign. It's battle after battle after battle after battle to achieve the, the goal of a stronger faith in our life. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So I can ask myself the question. In my life, what do I fight for? Uh, in my life, what do I run from? In my life, what do I run towards? <laughs> yeah. Am I fighting for more money? Am I fighting for my own reputation, my own position? Am I fighting to always be right? Or am I fighting for building my faith in the Lord? But do you see where we're going with this, with yeah. these verbs? What a challenge these verses are. What, what do I flee from in my life? What do I run towards? What do I flee towards, right? What do I pursue? What am I chasing? What do I fight for in my life? And the last one is, what do I take hold of? And this, this take hold is a, a, a word that means, what do I embrace? Okay. What do I embrace? The, what, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. All right? So this is the idea of, I said in the presence of many witnesses that I was a Christian, Am I embracing the Christian life? Am I embracing all that it means to be a Christ follower? Am I embracing that into my life? Or do I try to hold that at arm's length? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. What a challenge. So what, what am I running from? Am I running from the good things or am I running from the bad things? And, the bad things would be, am I, am I running from God? I know a lot of people that are running from God. God is pursuing. He's, he's on you. And what do you do? You run from him. Because you're running towards other things, other idols, like money in your life. What are you, what are you running towards? What are you pursuing in your life? There's a tremendous list there. Yeah. To ask yourself. I I have done this. I have written down these these four verbs and asked myself the question. What what am I running from in my life? I need to run from certain things. And that's a good Bible study. Look up the word flee in a concordance in the New Testament and check what we're supposed to be fleeing from. And then what, what am I pursuing? Boy, that's a, and that's a tremendous list. Am I pursuing that in my life? What am I fighting for? At work, do I fight for the next promotion? Or I, do I fight for a good testimony of faith? Yikes, right? And what do I embrace? Am I embracing the eternal life to which I was called? The call towards heaven. Am I living a heavenly life? I don't belong to this earth. I belong to heaven. Am I living that way? Am I embracing that idea in my life? Or am I busy pursuing the side hustle? Mm. What a study. What a challenge. These, these verses, I remember these verses just challenging me to my core. And I made some decisions in my life based upon what am I, what do I need to run from? And I've been in some industries where it was all about the money. And uh, I had to really evaluate, what am I pursuing? What am I running from? What am I pursuing? What am I fighting for every day? Do I fight for my relationship with Christ or do I fight for other things? <laughs> what do you think? I think it's pretty cool. That was very, very good. I, I, I mean, what stood out to me was that man of God and like how many people were actually called that. That's very pretty simple until we get to the new testament and we as believers are men of god and in fact 
women are men of God. Mm. Women are the sons of inheritance. I don't know that you know that or not. It's a very interesting Bible study about women's rights. But in this, in the New Testament, women are considered sons of inheritance. That's the that's the firstborn son, the son that gets it all. Wow. That's why he says there's neither male nor female nor Greek nor whatever. We're all sons of inheritance. That's cool. What a blessing. What a blessing. I hope this has been a challenge to you, a blessing to you. And I want you to think through those verses from, from verse 11 down to verse 15. And really think through those. Make yourself some lists. Ask yourself some hard questions. And your life could change. Uh, we'll stop here. Thank you. Hope you guys subscribe. I hope you liked it. I'd love to hear your comments. What do you run from? What do you run towards? What do you fight for? And what do you embrace in your life? As a Christian or as a non-Christian, I'd love to hear from you. Let me know your comments. And we'll end here. And we will see you next week. God bless you.